extragalactic clouds, uh, about molecular clouds in, in general, really, because um, molecular clouds are where stars form. Um, and I hope this will help people understand the session tomorrow morning better, where you talk about star formation, because um, most of the instruments that are being discussed here either observe the star formation or, um, as with SKA, the, uh, the, molec the atomic hydrogen. And so molecular clouds are sort of that intermediate step, although, of course, as with any process, there are many, many um, sub-intermediate steps. So we go from the H1, the H1 gets compressed a bit, forms cool H1, and then the cool H1 forms molecular clouds, which densify in certain regions, becoming cloud cores. And then in those cloud cores, stars form. If for whatever reason you can't hear me, please say something. And so why would we, would we be interested in clouds in other galaxies? Well, one obvious reason is that um, we are in the plane of our galaxy. We are in, I assume you're seeing, yes, you're seeing a picture, a two mass picture, that's to say a two micron view, an infrared view. And at two microns, the extinction is about a factor 10 lower than in the optical. So if our eyes were sensitive at two microns, and if we had very sensitive eyes, this is how we would see our galaxy. We would see the peanut-shaped bulge. We would see, but in absorption, the um, thin disk of molecular glass, gas um, in which the, uh, the stars, massive or not, form. Um, above, of course, that thin disk, we see stars. Um, and then you have the thick disk, which is apparent in, uh, in this image. And you immediately understand that we can't really identify where we're looking within our own galaxy. The rotation curve, when we do spectroscopy, can help us, but it doesn't give you good distances. And within the inner galaxy, you also have what we call the distance ambiguity. Is it the close, closer than halfway or further than halfway? Because the velocities are then the same. So it's very useful to look at other galaxies. And the second reason, although it's at least equally important, is that observing other galaxies enables us to observe galaxies that are not like our own. So one of the first galaxies, which was reasonably well observed, uh, is M33 in the local group. So it's at about 800 kiloparsecs, 800, 900 kiloparsecs. Uh, as you probably know, the most massive member of the local group of galaxies is Andromeda, then us, the Milky Way, and then M33. So M33, is a small spiral, it's a sub subsolar metallicity spiral, and it doesn't have a very pronounced spiral structure. You can see, now I, I think you probably see my mouse, you can see a bit of a spiral structure to the north and then another arm to the south, but you see some stuff everywhere. And M33, partly because it's a subsolar metallicity galaxy, does not have strong CO emission we trace molecular gas with the carbon monoxide molecule because we cannot directly see the H2 molecule. So we use carbon monoxide, which is the most common heteronuclear molecule. And the heteronuclear is important because that is what gives you rotational transitions. And the rotational transitions are the only ones that can be observed at low temperatures because the molecular gas before it actually forms a star is typically at 10 or a few tens of degrees Kelvin. So it's very cold, which is why we use obviously radio wavelengths. A second galaxy observed with the pause group by the pause group with the um, IRAM interferometer. M33 was, was observed with the IRAM single dish and M51 is almost 10 times further away but with the interferometer, you can get better resolution. So they could observe something with um, a spatial resolution, that's to say in parsecs, very similar to what we did with um, M33. So here you see the same two pictures, 
to the left, the integrated intensity, and to the right, the, the velocity field, just to show these are rotating galaxies. So in addition to seeing really what part of the galaxy we're looking at, because in these objects we can see quite well, note that we are not presenting any work on Andromeda, partly because Andromeda is seen almost edge on, and there's also a rather strong warp in Andromeda. So sometimes when we look through Andromeda, we look through several different arms, or at least two different arms. Okay, and the um, another advantage is the fact that distances are basically the same for all the clouds in the galaxy. So it's straightforward to compare clouds, and that's not at all true for um, clouds in the uh, in the Milky Way. So first, we want to know whether molecular clouds, which I will sometimes refer to as giant molecular clouds. Um, because those are the, the biggest structures that we think are gravitationally bound, but we'll come to that. Um, are they present and are their properties similar to those in the Milky Way? Um, we'd like to understand their mass spectrum, measure their mass spectrum. Is most of the mass in big or small clouds? If it's most of the mass is in small clouds, then it's very difficult to have a complete sample because there could be clouds below our intensity limit. Are they gravitationally bound? And do they same, do they show the same properties? In particular, um, what we call the Larson relations. And the first of the Larson relations is the link between the cloud size and the, the line width of the cloud, which is something that gives us an idea of the amount of turbulence and therefore the amount of mass. Do any of these things vary with galactocentric distance, right? Distance from the center of the galaxy. Um, do molecular clouds rotate? Why? In what direction? Is there anything systematic? So there are many questions we can ask. Uh, is star formation, right? We think of star formation in general as a small scale process, right? A molecular part of a molecular cloud condensing, forming a core, and then that core forms stars. However, the fact that galaxies that we call starburst galaxies exist. Um, and there are a few other examples, show that uh, star formation is also influenced by the large-scale environment. Okay, so we would like to know whether all galaxies or most galaxies convert molecular gas into stars at the same rate. So we're going to talk about the star formation efficiency, which is this rate of transformation of molecular gas into stars. That's an important um, uh, an important measurement for um, exogalactic people who study star formation. We'd like to understand uh, how long molecular clouds live. And when I say live, that means um, are in their uh, molecular phase because um, the, the cloud life cycle is forming, right? Formation through gravitational collapse, some perhaps aided by compression, the first generation of stars forming, perhaps the second generation of stars forming, um, and then stellar winds and supernovae dispersing the cloud. Okay, so we expect clouds to be closely linked to young stars, and indeed that is, uh, that is what we see uh, in many different ways. How does metallicity, I said M33 is a subsolar metallicity galaxy, if anything M51 is slightly um, over solar in terms of metallicity. So does metallicity play a role? And do we have any reason to think that the um, initial mass function, the IMF, uh, which is very, very important, um, is constant from one galaxy to another, from one metallicity to another, from one epoch to another? As, as you know, um, we mostly, most of the mass is in small stars, but most of the luminosity and most of the transformation of hydrogen into what we call metals is done in the mass of stars. So the initial mass function, which governs how much, how many massive stars are formed for um, some amount of low mass stars is a, an absolutely critical element. There have been a number of surveys surveys on the LMC, the Large Magellanic Cloud, 
which we saw at the lower left in my second slide. Um, a, num a fair amount of work on M33, partly because it's nearby, also because these first two galaxies are relatively small and have a subsolar metallicity. So they're very interesting sort of stepping stone towards either dwarf galaxies or high redshift ob objects. M51 and M33 have also been observed um, with respectively the IRAM interferometer and ALMA. ALMA, which you've probably heard of, the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, is um, a factor, represents a factor 10 increase in resolution and sensitivity because there are 64 antennae and um, they're on a very good site at slightly over 5,000 meters elevation in, in Chile, in the Atacama Desert, which is extremely dry. So ALMA is, is, is something very new for uh, millimeter wave astronomy and therefore star formation and the study of dense gas in general. A new project called FANGS, which has which started publishing, um, I was going to say last year, but actually it's 2021, we're now in 2023. Um, they're observing a large sample of galaxies at slightly poorer, but only marginally poorer resolution. There's a companion program with the um, integral field unit at, on MUSE. So that's uh, an excellent um, spectroscopic, spectroscopic imager and also the uh, big three on the Hubble Space Telescope. We've, I've been mentioning star formation. It's not always straightforward to measure the amount of star formation at high resolution because generally we use um, extinction-free far infrared indicators to measure the amount of star formation. And since far infrared imaging is only observed from space, we don't have very good resolution. So that's why it's important to have H alpha, maybe H beta, and if possible, free free um, radio imaging to estimate star formation rates. Of course, the hydrogen recombination lines are subject to um, extinction. So our first question was, is most of the mass in large clouds or in small clouds? Um, people generally thought that most of the mass was in large clouds from observations of our galaxy which are mostly observations of big clouds, and they're mostly observations of the inner galaxy, the molecular ring of our galaxy, which is between maybe two and five kiloparsecs. Now, the, our observations of M33 and subsequent observations of M51 show that actually in the inner part of the galaxy, most of the mass is in the form of large clouds. If this exponent here, the, the alpha, the slope of the um, mass function is less than two. It means that when you integrate the mass times the mass spectrum, n times n of m dm, then you get most of the mass in the larger clouds. If, on the other hand, that um, the, uh, the uh, exponent here is less, uh, sorry, is over two, but it has a minus sign in front of it, then it means that most of the mass is actually in the smaller clouds, okay, as is the case in the outer galaxy. And you find a very similar thing in M51. So that's already something useful, and it's probably true in our own galaxy. Uh, for better or worse, most of the mass is, let's just say most of the CO emission is within the inner part that's to say within the solar circle, for example, around galaxy. And that's also true with M51 and M33 and most galaxies so far as we can see. Are cloud characteristics similar? Here's a comparison between M33 in black and um, the outer Milky Way in red. Now, this is the line width, but normalized to a constant cloud size as a function of the distance from the galactic center. That's to say in black for M33 and in red for our galaxy. What this shows is that yes, they are similar. And secondly, that we have good measurements of these things for individual clouds. And that's important because the line width 
coupled with cloud size, allows us to estimate the cloud mass independently of how much of how many CO molecules are in the cloud. And this is a study from FANGS, but the other works find basically the same uh, result that the clouds are gravitationally bound because we have a mass estimated from sort of counting the CO molecules and a mass estimated from the dynamics of the cloud. That's what we call the virial mass sometimes. And that basically shows that clouds may or may not be what we call virialized. However, they do appear to be in their majority gravitationally bound. Now, because I have a few more minutes, I'd like to talk about um, a new study called ALMA IMF. The idea is to really study star formation at very high resolution in our own galaxy. So this is sort of where the cloud sample can be found in our galaxy. This is sort of an artist's view of our galaxy with the central bar, the um, with the position of the sun. You see in yellow the gold belt, right? The gold belt, that's the clouds around, the, uh, around us. And while these extragalactic studies typically go from whole galaxy down to about 50 parsec scales here, we're looking at the next few orders of magnitude because the idea is to observe a bunch of clouds, massive clouds, forming massive stars, down to about 0.01 parsec. That's 2,000 astronomical units. And the idea is to constrain the multiple star formation, understand as well as possible how star formation works, and identify the um, and study the massive protostars and understand whether they're, if you go down to uh, 2000 AU resolution, then we don't think you're going to have two massive protostars within that, um, within the, what we call the beam. Okay. And this is just the list of clouds. They're um, young, evolved, uh, intermediate, and evolved uh, clouds among them. And we, this is just, most of the results are not out. So I'm mostly describing the project here. But when you observe with a telescope like ALMA, you have very broad bandwidth and also extremely high resolution. So you can observe a huge number of molecules. This, these are the main molecules that we see, so the main lines. And you can use those, particularly in the uh, massive protostars, which are very bright. You see many lines. You can use them to look for outflows or shocks. You can look them. You can um, use the recombination lines as evolutionary indicators. You can measure temperatures because some of these lines have many different transitions. Uh, you can look at high dipole moment molecules to get an idea of where the dense gas is and how much dense gas there is. Anyway, you get a huge amount of information more information than we're currently getting from the extragalactic work, but the extragalactic um, work is looking more and more similar to what we're able to do in our own galaxies because of the improvements in resolution and sensitivity of new instruments like, uh, like ALMA. So we were talking about line width earlier, sort of our most basic property, and one of our questions was, um, is there a link between cloud properties and cloud metallicity, or galaxy metallicity, we're going to assume that clouds have share, share that metallicity, that has to be true. And something that's very interesting, with these rather large, sample of cloud, large samples of clouds, from M51 to the Milky Way, to M33, to the LMC, and 6822, which is an, another local group galaxy, we find that there is a regular decrease in line width for a given cloud size with metallicity. And that is something which, well, at least initially was surprising. And it would be, one sort of expects that sort of thing. This is the same plot, but on with linear scales and not log scales. So that shows us that when there's a lower metallicity, we actually have, the clouds are less turbulent and one might, expect that to have an effect on either the star formation, star formation efficiency or the initial mass, mass function of clouds. We're not necessarily able to separate the two. 
because if you form more high mass stars, then you get much more emission. So that would mimic an increase in the star formation efficiency. However, either effect, both effects or either effect is, uh, is important. So we can continue. So we find metallicity, it looks like metallicity does play a role. We can be interested in the life cycle. And indeed, we find for all of these galaxies, cloud lifetimes, and by lifetime, I mean um, the uh, while a given cloud is observable in CO and um, has not been dispersed and reformed, we find cloud lifetimes of 10 to 20 million years, so much, the, much less than a rotation uh, around the galactic center. I'm sort of jumping to my conclusions here because I think I should. Um, yes, so we find that um, indeed metallicity has an effect on the star formation efficiency. The star formation efficiency goes roughly as um, one over the, metal the metallicity. That's to say that low, met low metallicity galaxies convert their molecular gas into stars uh, considerably more quickly than um, most spirals. And at the same time, most as the large spirals have uh, a very constant star formation efficiency. That's to say, um, their most galaxies sort of convert um, their, let's say the star formation efficiency defined as this ratio is basically one over two billion years at uh, solar metallicities, and that's a very um, reliable number. That has a few consequences. Um, the, main conse the main consequence is that it shows that in solar metallicity spirals, both the, um, molecular, the molecular interstellar medium and the IMF are similar. And that's actually two strong statements because it means that we have both the molecular clouds and also the way clouds convert their, their molecular gas into stars. So I think I'll let you read the rest because uh, I'm convinced my time is up. And if, I, if you have any questions, I would be very happy to answer. So thank you. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, we have a time for questions. Do you have any questions? Yeah, I can maybe start with them. Sorry, Jonathan, this is Mamta. I'm sorry, I'm slightly late. Yes, so, hi, Mamta. <laughs> yeah, so it was a great talk. And I was just wondering how many such molecular clouds have you been observing, studying until now? Do we have any kind of statistical results? When you talk about lifetime of these molecular clouds, do you have any uh, statistics coming from ALMA observations to understand about those lifetimes and how the, the, the whole cloud evolves over time? What are the time scales and what uh, is again the restarting phase? Okay. Um, we, for the moment, I think the answer is that from ALMA, we don't really have those numbers because when you have a large number of molecular clouds, and for M33, that was 566. For M51, they had um, 1,500 clouds, of which about half were considered high-quality clouds. A lot of work is involved because you need to classify stars, uh, sorry, clouds, in terms of clouds without star formation, that's our A class here, clouds with embedded star formation, which you see um, which you can identify as clouds without um, H alpha or UV emission, but with um, mid infrared emission, typically 24 or 8 microns. And then you have what we call the exposed star formation, which is when you see in H alpha and UV, but also 8 and 24 microns. So that's our C class. 
And um, this sort of classification is actually extremely time-taking. And so when you have a large number of clouds, very few groups have done it. So, um, yes, this is the sort of thing um, we find, but there's nothing out on that from Alma yet. Uh, this was done by Akiko Kawamura in the Large Magellanic Cloud. Uh, it was done by ourselves for M33 uh, a couple of times with different, with uh, smaller and then complete cloud samples. Um, some of that has been done with the pause clouds, clouds, that's to say M51, but um, we don't have, so far as I know, um, results on a large sample of clouds from, uh, from ALMA in terms of cloud lifetime. Okay. And then the second question is about uh, how can we develop this part more with SKA because we will also have extra connected lines a bit or all sorts yes. of lines that will be detected with SKA mute. Uh, so that's where uh, it will be interesting to know what can be done with SKA. Yes, SKA I think is most gonna, mostly going to be um, useful to, um, well, First of all, to observe the H1, obviously, and free-free. Uh, and with the H1 observations, to um, try and separate the cold neutral medium, that's to say the H1, which is at, say, 100 degrees Kelvin, and which is much denser than the diffuse gas, which is at maybe 5,000 to 8,000 degrees. Um, we assume, although there's evidence for that, that it is the cool phase that then becomes molecular, perhaps with um large-scale turbulence right which would which would compress a part of it and uh, provoke the condensation into molecular gas so i think ska is going to be very useful for the free free for um maybe predicting where future generations of molecular clouds are going to form and understanding why the current generation of molecular clouds and in particular the clouds that we call A clouds, that's the same clouds without, which have not uh, started forming stars yet. Um, it'll be useful to understand um, what the H1 characteristics of the uh, region around those clouds um, are. And uh, I would be personally interested in understanding the, uh, whether they're, whether the clouds uh, the H1 around the clouds is seen to rotate in the same direction, prograde, um, as the molecular clouds, because we do see that molecular clouds rotate, all, albeit very slowly. And it'd be nice to see if you see the same feature in the in the H1, more or less strongly. Um, there are some molecules that are observable um, within the SCA, particularly the high frequency SCA yeah. range, although it depends where exactly that's going to be. Okay, yes. I'm not, I, I couldn't give you the molecule names, but often they're um, heavy molecules. Yes, yes. Okay. So they would trace typically yeah. dense regions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, thank you. We have a question. Uh, so the, this uh, result you mentioned about the uh, turbulence having a metal sheet independence is a very interesting uh, result, I think. And I just want to know if you have any idea from uh, uh, numerical simulations that so any such trend uh, in any existing literature about the turbulence uh, depending on the metallicity. Okay, I heard the last bit of the question depending on the metallicity, but what was the um. Maybe somebody closer to the microphone could repeat it. Uh, is there any clue from uh, numerical simulation of, of that ah. effect you know, that's already known? Or? Okay, the question is about numerical simulations. Yeah, it's about numerical simulations that we're talking about to explain turbulence in uh, these uh, uh, clouds, actually. Okay, um, the answer is yes, although not very many. Um, I have a slide on that. Yes. Um, the, um, the stellar winds from low metallicity stars are weaker. 
So we do expect a bit less turbulence from the weaker stellar winds. Okay, it's not clear to me that that is enough to explain the difference, but it is certainly one thing that goes in that direction. A um, another feature which I think is important and is um, sort of very obvious is that in a low metallicity environment, there's less dust, which means that um, since molecular hydrogen forms on dust grains, the H1 will convert to H2 at a somewhat higher density. So it's not really surprising that perhaps the turbulence is lower, although that's not completely certain, but definitely the free fall time is lower. So it may be, uh, I, I would expect the link between metallicity and turbulence to come from those two features, the weaker stellar winds and the fact that the H2 forms already at a higher density. Uh, we have uh, one more question. Yeah. <laughs> and thanks for that nice review. Uh, this uh, my question is on the value of the derived star formation efficiency. So that depends on the the molecular mass that uh, you have derived. So you didn't mention anything about the conversion factor. No, it depends heavily on the metallicity also. So how much effect of this uncertainty in the conversion factor will affect the derived star formation efficiency? Okay, the conversion factor, particularly for low metallicity objects, certainly is an issue. <laughs> for galaxies like M33, it's probably not all that much of an issue, because we're probably within a factor of about two. Anyway, it's something that we, um, that we try and measure. Um, there are excellent, very high quality Herschel dust observations at um, five wavelengths, right, up to 500 microns. So at 500 microns, you can see the, the rather cool dust. And so we think we have um, a good idea of the conversion factor for M33. That may be one of the most solid examples. Um, for NGC 6822, for example, the same, same kind of observations are available as well. Although, as you go down in metallicity, you do go up in uncertainty. But, you know, remember, this is the, the finding that the star formation efficiency is higher in NGC 6822 is nonetheless based on a conversion factor, which is 20 times higher, not just linear, that's to say three times higher, but 20 times higher, because... Um, it was measured with um, many different uh, tracers. And you also have the virial masses that you can estimate because you are looking at the individual clouds. So there's certainly an error margin for all this. However, uh, it seems clear today that there is a um, an increase in the star formation efficiency, which is independent of any uncertainty on the conversion factor um, with metallicity. Long live India and France friendship.